Hi everyone, my name's Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist and also a PhD student specialising and studying the evolution of law card. Catfish is also known as plecos. But today, or you might have noticed in some of my videos, that I do have another sort of fish that I'm not as interested in compared to law cards, but they interest me just as much. And this has to be discus fishes, so this is the genus Symphysodon. I believe they're most closely related to other fishes like Uraru. Um, um, most closest relative would actually be the angel fishes, which you can kind of see why. So you can see here that they will feed on the surface just like that, and that's what they're really adapted to do. So they're detritivores, alcohols, they feed on the surface. Um, of course, the issue is that these are domestics and they're not often fed like they would be in the wild. And I think that it's just an interesting idea. But today I'm not entirely going to talk about their feeding. Well, I might because it's actually really interesting. But today I'm going to talk about why they are, in my opinion, the best cichlids out there. And I've kept a variety. So I started off mostly with Pistogramma, then I kept a Microgeophagus. So Microgeophagus is the ram cichlids. Um, then I went on to a mixture of different um, of those South American dwarf cichlids and working the trade I ended up working with a variety, a whole different variety of different things. I've kept Satan Perkia or Satan Persia which are like Geophagus, I think they're very closely related. Kept all different Tanganyikans, Malawi but I ended up, well, I don't have a pistogram anymore and they were sort of a real passion for me as a young uh, teenager, young um, young person I guess um, and I have these guys instead and they are basically a pistogram in a bigger package in my opinion they are well considerably bigger than a pistogram and they're not like me waving my hands around because that's what discus do um, they don't really like much movement and the platys have somehow copied them and now the platys don't like me moving around particularly that much so why are they the best cichlids in my opinion? Well personally I think there's so many reasons why. Firstly we do have three recognised species in the genus Symphysodon, so that's discus, that's Symphysodon discus, Symphysodon tarzu which is the green discus um, and then Symphysodon um, aquafasciatus which is the blue, blue discus I think. Um, this, uh, Symphysodon discus is uh, the um, now I've just totally forgotten, but the one with barring. There are, so Symphysodon heraldi is commonly mentioned as the brown discus, but it's kind of been split up between those three species and some undescribed species. There's more undescribed species. But the big thing about discus is how much diversity there is actually in the domestics and in the wilds. You can look at what is available in the wilds and there's so many different colour patterns even within sort of similar localities I guess. And between the three species and I find it particularly interesting that it's imposed on discus, uh, the um, why is it? Um, heckle discus. That is actually really genetically indistinct from Symphysodon aquafasciatus, which is the blue discus. But Symphysodon tarzu, that looks very similar to Symphysodon uh, aquafasciatus, is actually very distantly related to all of the others um, that are currently described. And then there's the Zingu, Rio Zingu discus. And it's just fascinating that diversity of wild and then if you look at the domestics you've got the pigeon bloods and related types that don't really bar you've got a uh, turks so turquoise the red covers i believe red covers oh they're just drama queen <laughs> so they are just drama queens and they hate me moving around the tank because it is only a pair so the red covers i believe they're most closely related to symbolized on how well Heraldi, but heraldi has been split up, so which they're most closely related to, who knows? There's different variants even similar to, so you've got San, uh, San Mara, um, I think aren't oh, red melons and that lot related? These do bar, so they're very different from the uh, pigeon blood type, uh, so like fire red, a marlboro red, um, they're not as intense red, but then they bar and I think it looks a lot more natural, and they don't pepper. 
Um, other than that, there is much more diverse. There's white, uh, so the Dark Angels from um, Stenka. There's other sort of lighter colours. There's yellows. Yellows are a little bit more faffy to keep. And they're a little bit more complex than I think a lot of people look at. And there's no actual one sort of, I guess, outside of Rift Valley that has that much diversity maybe in colour. Although there's Cyclas Soma, I guess. Um, but if you look at discus themselves, like, they are only those three recognised species. Uh, from the Rift Valley, Alunacara is a massive genus um, of many different species. Um, Neolampologus, that's stuff like shell dweller. So um, Alunacara is the peacocks, stuff like that. Um, uh, Neolampologus is shell dwellers, fairy cichlids, and quite a few different mix and match of different genera. I guess it, I don't know if it needs splitting up, but there is that much diversity just in advised them. So what else is interesting about them? They're social. Um, unlike a lot of um, cichlids, so you get cichlids that pair, you get cichlids at home. These guys do pair and I think that really, I don't think entirely has been explored or understood about that time after they're shoaling and what, like how it works in the wild. But they are social, so in the wild they will shoal in about th oh, thousands, hundreds, and then they're split up and go into pairs. So they're very different from what we traditionally think of as cichlids. And um, the other comparison might be Tyrophyllum, the angelfishes. Obviously closely related. They don't show in as many numbers. So angelfishes will um, show in about 30. And this is why I think they're quite interesting, their social grouping. It's not quite like the shoaling you see from tetra or even live bearers. It's very different because they're entirely different taxa with, I guess, different morphology, different aims. You could, I guess, morphologically, they aren't entirely that different from, I guess, the mouth morphology from even like Paku, uh, well, Paku, definitely. Um, Paku, um, Silver Dollars, stuff like that. But, so... They are very different just socially from other cichlids. There's not really much that compares. Of course you've got geophagus that do sort of shoal, but it's not really the same sort of tight social groups um, that you'll see of discus. They do in the wild, so they will pair up after, I think it's that around that year mark. They don't actually live that long in the wild, so I don't think there's been any studies to say about what happens after that in the wild, we just know about in captivity. So whether they go back to a shoal, there was one three-year-old male, we don't really know. But it's just so interesting. And on that sociality aspect, when it comes to breeding, these are fishes that produce a mucus that the offspring feed off. And that mucus is really vital for the offspring. Like milk producing, I think it's colostrum and having all the antibodies, um, antibodies I guess, um, bacteria, all the vital nutrients for mammalian offspring. Discus fishes have been shown that that mucus is vital for the um, gut biota of um, their offspring as well, which I think is absolutely fascinating. These are, they pair, they care for their young like most cichlids, most cichlids are very good at brood um, parental care, but it's something different. And they're very easy to breed in captivity. This pair is oldish, um, so I don't actually know how old, but I've had them over a year and they were fully grown and they were rehomes when I got them, so who knows how old they are. But they have spawned, um, my male over there has spawned multiple times um, with his different females. Um, and that just makes it it's so interesting because they're so willing to, but I guess most cichlids are. They can stop breeding at a very young age. I've seen them do it, like, less than, because they're the size of my hand. I would say half that size I've seen them breed. Um, not that I'd recommend it, and I don't really want them to spawn particularly well. But, so, what else about them? Their feeding is fascinating, so... Symphysodon, as uh, so a discus, a lot of people say are carnivores. Even if you look at their mouth morphology, it's nothing like a carnivore. They are actually detritivores and albivores. They feed, I think it's around 70 to 80% detritus algae, mixture of that. 
Then a lot of what you'd consider more herbivorous, I guess, so algival, detritivore, and very little um, invertebrates, crustaceans, and that does change seasonally, seasonally, so sometimes they might eat none. Although that study was focused on, I think it was symbolized on heraldi, so we don't really know what it was focused on. I guess I could compare locality to work out which species it was, whether it was an undescribed species. But there's plenty of uh, personal experience that people have seen them in the wild on what they do eat, um, which is that sort of herbivorous diet. They really don't like me standing and waving around. Um, so they are different. Um, an interesting thing about them is that Paku-like face, that um, lip, that mouth that is a bit more blunt than a predatory fish which has that ability, that propulsion ability. These guys don't really have that. You can even see it in angel fishes where they have that ability to push for their mouth to grab the food. Whereas this, I've done a video showing their mouth morphology, it's nothing like. Another fact or thing is that Cichlids, a lot of fishes have a second pair of jaws, that's known as the pharyphangal jaws or pharyngeal jaws. So discus do as well. A lot of cichlids can have quite well developed pharyngeal jaws. Um, they can have teeth, they can be quite, um, well, advanced I guess for different food items. Um, but discus don't really um, have it so well developed as far as there's, I haven't seen any CT scans. Um, X-rays might be of some use, but and I don't know how you'd even extract it from a discus. But they don't have that well or so of red um, pharyngeal jaws, which I wonder whether that's very close or to do with their diet. Their diet doesn't involve that much processing. Maybe it just doesn't fit in their body shape. But they definitely don't have the body for a predator. They can't really, a lot, when you look at sort of predators, uh, carnivorous species, they do tend to have that more narrow head because they're trying to get into things, break it apart. Um, whereas these guys don't really have that. They do have quite strong jaws, I think, but it's more blunt because they're taking something off a surface. You can see it when you feed, feed them off a surface, but not many people do. Um, Obviously, because beef heart, you don't really stick it to the surface of the tank. Uh, dry food, it sinks. Uh, so there's a few exceptions, or, and especially finding ones that contain algae. Discus, I think, just based on their morphology, their wild diet, they aren't always the easiest to feed. And one thing that I think most people will with this whole captive care is they aren't always the easiest fish to keep. A lot of people who say they are easy, maybe sometimes it's looking at different perspectives, have where you've started, what you've done beforehand, because I've never had them as a challenge, but then I've kept and worked mostly different soft water fishes, different maybe wild caught challenging fishes. The first ever discus I looked after were wild, as in based on Tarzu. So something else, why are discus so brilliant? I think also tank mates. So a lot of cichlids, of course we're talking about a group of thousands of species, it's very difficult to generalise. Um, oh, he just looks at me sometimes like that and it's like, I know you just want food. So, so with tank mates, so obviously there's quite a diversity of things you can keep them with and it does involve some real planning, I think, because they are a little bit maybe more specialised. You don't want them with uh, anything fast feeding, anything boisterous. But they are a nice fish that you can kind of plan your tank around. Um, so the high temperatures are limiting, I guess. Um, high temperatures, they, well, flow rate is an interesting one. So. Definitely we do not provide the same amount of flow that they would experience in the wild. It's much less in an aquarium. And they have been found in areas of a higher current. So they, I find them quite adaptable in that regard. Obviously you don't want to put them in a hill stream like river manifold tank. Um, but that's very difficult to actually provide. And that kind of means that it, 
does leave it more open. There's quite a few different things you could keep them with, but I think the problem comes where a lot of people keep maybe ill-suited tank mates. Ideally, nothing like Corridorus, the cooler water lower carids. You don't want boisterous, so no clown loaches ideally. So they are a little bit of planning in that regard. So I wrote it down because I'm like, oh, there's so much you could keep them with, but then there's it's also that's what I like. I keep things that kind of work with them, I guess. But they are fascinating fishes. Their behaviour is much more complex. I think people want something that's a little bit more interactive and you don't entirely get that from Discus. You might find a few individuals that are, like um, that one over there um, is a little bit more. And I would say maybe it's a male thing. Um, although for Pistogramma, I can definitely say the females were a lot more interactive. I think a lot of people, when they say they're boring, you look at, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for a fish that is something you can kind of watch from a distance, they have, they do need a complex setup. If you're going to give them a bear tank, you're not going to see any behaviour. And they're, they're not that sort of sick that I think a lot of people want, or like puffer fish, they want something that will beg at them, although discus do. So I think it's always worth thinking about. Anyway, I'm going to end this video here. It's mostly rambling about why I like discus, but there's no issue with that. Um, ignore the mess, um, because that's just a pile of my stuff. Anyway, thank you for watching. And if you like my videos, please comment, like, and subscribe. And goodbye.